so Ben Rosner uh, runs our, uh, our science department downstairs, our environmental scientists. He's been here uh, almost as long as I have. Uh, how many years? 17 years? Uh, so he's going to talk about the ever-changing WOTUS rules and where they stand at the moment. And when I first asked him to, to fill in and, and have this chat today, um, I think we both knew that uh, I'm sure it was going to be different than the, a different presentation three weeks ago than it is now or four weeks ago or two months ago. So anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome Ben Rosner. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm not sure why this plate of cookies was placed right here, but if at any point somebody needs cookies during my talk, feel free just to come right up. Uh, you may have to share a slide or two, but um, all right. So we'll, we'll dive in here. We're going to talk today about what are waters of the United States and what does that really mean on the ground? Um, we've been dealing with a lot of legal issues in the past few years uh, regarding waters of the United States. Um, primarily, we've, we were living under, under uh, the 1986 rule since, well, 1986, and um, a lot of the agencies decided that things were too complex, it uh, wasn't easy to understand, too many things were being regulated, or not enough things were being regulated, and uh, under the Obama administration, they came up with uh, a new rule. Um, we're calling that the, the 2015 rule because that one that is when it was released um, and so that's kind of where we're gonna dive in because that's the the world we are currently living in so real briefly what are waters what are lotus or waters of the United States um, it's things like the Chesapeake Bay it's tributaries uh, the those tidal wetlands uh, that you see uh, surrounding the bay and some of your more traditional wetlands you might think of you know these bald cypress swamps things like that um, but it also includes uh, small smaller streams and tributaries so the the creek that might be running through your backyard or through your neighborhood park those could be considered waters of the united states as well so that's high level why does it matter to you um, well if you want to impact one of those features, if you want to impact a, a tidal water body or if you want to cross a stream with a, with a, a culvert, um, if you want to fill in a wetland for a project, if you want to discharge stormwater even, uh, you will need approvals from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, from your state 401 agency. So in Virginia, that's the DEQ. Um, this can also have triggers to other related aspects so under the uh, under the federal regulations you have to address endangered and threatened species if the agents if the Corps of Engineers is going to issue a wetlands permit um, and you also have to address cultural resources so if you have a historic property out there if there's some uh, known um, <clears throat> like a slave ruins and we have a couple of those in Loudoun County that have been really interesting and They've had to deal with over the years. But those are the kinds of things that would need to be addressed as part of the Corps of Engineers issuing a wetlands permit for a project. So it's really good to know uh, where these waters exist and um, so you can either avoid them or, or get the appropriate permits. Otherwise, you'll end up in a, a heap of trouble potentially. All right, so we got the, this current 2015 rule. This was, this was born out of uh, decades and decades of um, legal cases going back and forth. You know, what, where does the United States federal jurisdiction start and stop? Uh, most recently, in 2006, there was this case called uh, Rapanos versus the United States, um, where the Supreme Court took that case up and basically ended up with three different decisions. Um, four of the justices finding uh, for uh, against, four finding four, and one in the middle saying, well, I agree with this side, but for extremely different reasons. Um, so the, the 2015 rule was supposed to kind of get us some clarity coming out of, of those cases. Um, clarity in jurisdiction, uh, better bright lines, they call them, of jurisdiction. Um, and ideally less costly and less complex permits. 
So 2015, the, the rule was, was released and it was immediately uh, stopped by various lawsuits from various, um, various interests and actually only really went into play here in Virginia, only came into effect in August of last year. So basically, you know, three, three years almost of this rule living in limbo uh, and, and the regulated public not having a great idea of, of what to expect. Um, but the rule basically breaks out WOTUS into four different categories, things that are jurisdictional by rule, things that are similarly situated isolated wetlands, and waters that need individual case specific significant nexus decisions. And that term significant nexus was born out of one of those court cases. That's a whole beast in itself. Um, and then waters that are neighboring or adjacent. Have a cookie while you're going by. No All right. <laughs> um, so we came up with, uh, back, in, back in 2015, when we thought the rule was gonna go into effect immediately, we kind of came up with this, this fun diagram. This was done by one of our uh, in-house uh, landscape architects, you know, the, the folks that like to draw pretty pictures. Um, to help kind of give some clarity because the rule is the rule is pretty long and it's actually even though it's supposed to provide clarity it's a little convoluted to try and read and understand and the, the diagram does help some so we're going to go through uh, some of these different these different regions we called it wetlandia um, just kind of our fun title there so the the first category waters that are jurisdictional by rule basically you've got anything that was that was ever used for um, interstate commerce, things that are subject and subject to the ebb and flow of the tide. Um, so these are like your typical tidal, wa tidal water bodies. This would include like the Chesapeake Bay, it's tidal wetlands. Um, it would also include the Potomac River as far up as it's navigable. So at least, at least all of the way to the, uh, the dam there and Great Falls. Um, but it could also include areas above that that were traditionally navigable. So if fur traders carried their canoes up around the falls and then kept going, it would go all the way to the point where uh, they might have traditionally stopped to like, trade beaver pelts or what have you. Um, so all interstate waters, including interstate wetlands, that would be you know, your wetlands that, that cross uh, or have parts in, in multiple states. Uh, the territorial seas, so like the thing about the Atlantic Ocean, whatever the, the U.S.'s extent uh, yeah, out into international, before you hit international waters. Um, impoundments of any of those waters. So, you know, if you put a, if you build a dam on a stream or on a river and you create a, a lake or a pond, that pond or lake would be a jurisdictional water of the U.S. All tributaries, as defined below, so that's be all, all streams, so ephemeral, intermittent, perennial streams, uh, as long as they have an ordinary higher watermark and define bed and bank. And then all waters adjacent to a water identified in, in one through five above. Um, and they had to, they came up with the whole term of adjacent there. The 1986 rule had a, uh, a definition of adjacent in the 2015 rule, they updated that to make it much more inclusive and we'll, we'll get into that. So here's some examples of that. Uh, the things we talked about here, here's your territorial sea, um, you know, a river coming up here. Here's where the, the fur trader stops uh, traditionally. Um, here's an impoundment on a, on a stream, uh, a wetland that crosses these, these state boundaries here. So then we get into these similarly situated isolated wetlands. So the isolated wetlands don't necessarily have a, uh, they're not considered adjacent. And they're not directly, they're not directly touching or neighboring uh, the features that we just went through. Um, but, uh, but they have some, you know, significant nexus to those features. And they, they go through and define these as prairie potholes, Carolina bays and Delmarva bays, Pocosins, western vernal pools, Texas coastal prairie wetlands. Um, so they go, they go through and get very specific as with 
these known kind of ecological wetlands. Um, you know, certainly in here, uh, in uh, sorry, in the Mid Atlantic region, uh, probably the closest thing we might come across these Carolina bays and Delmarva bays. Western vernal pools are very specific to, to California and certainly the Texas coastal prairie wetlands. You would not expect to find those here. Um, so example of that, you know, you have these like these prairie potholes you'd find out in the Midwest. Um, you know, no no direct connection, but uh, they're considered similarly situated um, and therefore having this significant nexus. Then you have other waters that need an individual case by case specific significant nexus determination. So if you have a wetland doesn't meet any of the previous criteria, um, the core basically goes out and says, yeah, we're going to make this significant nexus determination. So uh, they're looking at uh, a number of factors, and we'll get into those, I think, here in a, in a minute as to what they mean by that significant nexus. Um, but these are things that traditionally would have been, would have been considered isolated. Uh, the Corps of Engineers would not take federal jurisdiction over these, but the state DEQ here in Virginia would have. So here's our significant nexus. Um, I won't, I won't read the, the whole definition unless people are going to a food coma and you want to be put to sleep. But um, I think Dan said we'll have these slides available for those that, that really want to, to read through all this. Um, but you're, you're looking at a number of, of, of functions to determine if it has a, a significant nexus or not. So sediment trapping, nutrient recycling, pollutant trapping, retention and attenuation of floodwaters, runoff storage, contribution of flow, export of organic matter, food resources, and we're providing a uh, life cycle dependent aquatic habitat. So think about, um, you know, uh, tadpoles in a, in a seasonal pool uh, that could be, that could potentially provide that, um, that function and therefore have a significant nexus. Um, ultimately, this is up to the regulators and if they feel that it, that it meets the requirements or not. So, you know, with all the things they talked about, you know, hey, let's try and get clarity with this rule. I feel like there were still a lot of areas where it was left um, quite gray. So we've got some examples of that. Um, <laughs> these areas that might not be a WOTUS because they're um, uh, well outside and wouldn't have that significant nexus. Uh, one of the key things that they talk about with significant nexus is um, things that are neighboring. And to be neighboring, uh, you're essentially within, within 4,000 feet of one of those uh, features that are jurisdictional by rule. So if you're within 4,000 feet of a tributary stream, or if you're within 4,000 feet of a tidal water body, then it would be considered neighboring, and that helps pushed it into this significant nexus category. And so that's what we see going on here. We've kind of put this 4,000 foot buffer along these features. And so these wetlands within that may be considered waters of the United States. Uh, if they meet that, the full significant nexus determination. So now instead of just going out in the field and saying, oh yeah, I've got a wetland and it touches a stream, therefore it's jurisdictional the core, uh, you got something that doesn't fit that, you're like, okay, how far am I? Is it within 4,000 feet? And you start making measurements. And um, again, I think there were, that's them putting these exact distances in are supposed to help with some of that, uh, that bright line, but it certainly is uh, some, some additional work. So the term adjacent. Um, essentially it means if it's bordering, contiguous, or neighboring. Um, so if you have a wetland, it directly touches a stream, that's considered adjacent. Um, for neighboring, they had to come up with a whole new definition. So we, we get into that here in a, in a second. Um, but anything that is um, separated by, by a natural barrier, like a natural river berm, a dune, like a sand dune or a dike, those are still considered to be um, bordering or contiguous or neighboring. So under the 
86 rule, it had that same definition. And then in a minute here, when we get into the latest proposed rule, we'll see how that goes away. So neighboring, all water is located within 100 feet of the Oregon High Water Mark. So if it's not directly touching, if you're within 100 feet, that's still considered neighboring. Anything that's within the 100 year floodplain, although they never actually defined how they're considering floodplain, whether that's a FEMA floodplain or some other locally determined floodplain, because um, FEMA doesn't map all 100 year floodplains. Uh, so there's some more uh, gray area that was introduced there. Um, anything within 1500 feet of a tie, high tide line uh, or the ordinary high water mark of the Great Lakes. So we've got some, some more examples here. So here's that, the yellow is the kind of that 100 foot buffer looking through. So this, this wetland here is adjacent. It's got a natural levee, but it's also still within 100 feet. Um, same with this, this one here. And it doesn't have to entirely be within, it's just gotta be at least partially within that, that 100 feet. Um, here we've got one that's outside of the 100 feet. It's outside of the floodplain, which is that, uh, that cross hatching that we have on there. And it's also greater than 1500 feet, which is the, I guess that's like a purple color um, from the, the high tide line. So, you know, here's something that would get uh, taken out completely from that adjacent term, um, but still could be what we're calling those A waters because it would be within that 4,000 feet. So you, you would still have to go and run that significant nexus determination. So who's, who's got this perfectly down so far? Completely clear? Yeah, that's kind of how we felt when they first released the rule. We, we read it over and over about 800 times. Um, and so maybe, I don't know, maybe it was good that we didn't have to deal with it for like the first three years. It gave us three years to, <laughs> to figure it out. Um, the nice thing about the rule though is they did specifically say, hey, here are things that are not waters of the United States. Like this is very clear, we're, we're clear on this. Um, and a lot of these things were actually in the 86 rule, but not, not in the rule itself, but in the preamble of the rule. So a lot of, it was nice that they actually codified those things for, for folks. So waste treatment systems, waste treatment lagoons, prior converted cropland, which also has its own set of, of rules and court cases to go along with it as to what that, what that definition really means. Um, Ditches with ephemeral flow, where you haven't relocated a tributary. So if you took a stream and you straightened it and moved it somewhere else, it would still be jurisdictional. Um, if, it, if you just created a ditch in uplands, that would not be jurisdictional. So that's what they mean when they, they get at the, uh, the relocated tributary part. Uh, same thing with ditches with, with intermittent flow. Um, and then ditches that do not flow directly or through another water. So if, you, if somebody puts a ditch through a wetland, that would still be considered jurisdictional, but if you um, don't have it uh, connected or running through a wetland or another tributary, it would not be jurisdictional. However, ditches with perennial flow are considered waters of the US. Uh, so artificially irrigated areas, artificial constructed lakes and ponds, so things for, for stock watering, um, artificial reflecting pools or swimming pools, small ornamental waters created in dry land. A lot of that is the key. Any of these like features that were man-made, if they were constructed in dry land, that's, that's basically the, the main thing in terms of pushing it out of being a water in the US. Um, DEQ could still take jurisdiction over it if they wanted because here in Virginia, they regulate all state surface waters. So something to be aware of, but I can't, I can't think of a time ever where they've regulated a swimming pool. So, so far, so good. Uh, water filled depressions created in dry land instead of the minor construction activity. So, you know, those uh, when the pits are um, getting down to whatever it's uh, their base elevation and they're starting to let them fill back up with water. Um, those are those are not considered jurisdictional. Any erosional features. Uh, and any puddles. 
So we've got Jen is, is still looking for clarification from the core as to what exactly is a puddle, right, Jen? So, um, and any groundwater. So um, basically, it's it's got to be it's got to be surface water. So anything in the ground, aquifers, uh, anything going through a subsurface drainage system drainage system, those are not considered waters of the US. And uh, stormwater control features, the so stormwater management ponds, dry or wet. Again, though, if those were built online, if you, if you created a wet pond as an impoundment, um, that would still be considered jurisdictional. Otherwise, uh, if it was created in, in uplands, uh, it's not gonna be, uh, it's not gonna be a uh, waters of the US. Uh, rain gardens and bioswales. We've got some examples of both of those here at our office. I think Margaret's going to give folks that are interested a tour later, and you can see some of these things. Um, and groundwater recharge basins. Okay, so then what had happened was Obama left office, Trump entered office, and decided, you know, with the with 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 that administration's agenda, they're gonna change a lot of the rules. That was stated up front, we're doing away with, dra we're draining the swamp, maybe literally and figuratively in this case, um, but uh, they, they worked for a few years on a new rule and it was proposed uh, at the end of 2018 and actually published in February. And this rule really swings the pendulum back the other way. So. When we're looking at the, the 2015 rule, you know, with these 4,000 foot rules and the, the floodplain stuff, a lot of that uh, and the similar, similarly situated wetlands especially kind of expanded the Corps' ability uh, to regulate uh, more wetlands and more land than previously. The proposed rule pushes it back not just to where it was in 1986, but probably farther back the other way. Um, so not only would you drop out a lot of the features now regulated under the 2015 rule, but you would also drop out features that had been regulated for decades prior. Um, so no changes to a couple main things, like the definition of a wetland didn't change, high tide line didn't change, ordinary high water mark, that's all the same. Ephemeral streams, which were considered tributaries under both um, both prior rules, are now out altogether, um, and that's a really big thing um, in states like Maryland, where the, uh, the state um, the MDE uh, they do not regulate ephemeral streams already. So in Maryland, if the Corps is no longer regulating ephemeral streams, nobody is. Um, in Virginia, the DQ is still gonna regulate ephemeral streams, so we're not gonna see any changes there. Um, but that's, that's a big thing. When they publish this rule, they are also asking for comment as to whether they should also drop out intermittent streams. So that would really uh, push things back. Um, you know, push push jurisdiction back a lot farther than than ever before, uh, and then you start thinking about okay, wetlands that are uh, adjacent to those ephemeral and intermittent streams, they would lose their jurisdictional connection that they currently have, and those would also get thrown out the window. Um, again, so in Virginia, not a whole lot would change because we still have the state DEQ that uh, would regulate those features. But there's a number of states out there uh, that don't have state wetland programs, um, so it's really gonna it's really gonna change the landscape in a, in a lot of ways. Um, so again, all those all those things that were considered isolated, those are definitely out now. Um, they're a little more clear on what they mean by by ditches, uh, and then going back to that term adjacent, you know, they um, they redefined it. And here we're comparing the original 1986 language versus the 2019 language. Um, so here we talked about, you know, wetlands that were separated by, uh, you know, dikes, dunes, barriers, that kind of thing. 
those are now very clearly out. Basin language here, they're saying that such waters are not adjacent. Um, so ditches that, that still satisfy the definition of a tributary would be considered adjacent, or would be considered jurisdictional rather. Um, so that's a, little, that's a little more clear than what we had in 86. Um, and again, there's that about the uh, perennial or intermittent flow. Um, ephemeral waters are out, um, and they may reduce that further to just be perennial streams. Uh, definition of a wetland stayed the same. Adjacent wetlands, um, they changed their definition of adjacent slightly. Um, and that was on this, this last slide here. Um, high tide is the same. Ordinary high water mark is the same. Um, so there's been some studies done since the rule was released to figure out, is there really going to be an effect? Um, St. Mary's University of Minnesota did a study uh, where they looked at um, three different scenarios, kind of the, the most restrictive scenario being, you know, if they went the route where only perennial streams um, were, were regulated tributaries and then the, the waters below them. Uh, the, the very restrictive scenario, which still included intermittent streams. And then the less restrictive scenario, if they somehow, you know, when they published the final rule, if, it, if they put ephemeral streams back in. Um, and we were seeing changes of, of basically reduction in, in jurisdiction of 16 to 36% in Minnesota, 3 to 55% in Colorado, and 11 to 69% in New Mexico. So again, that's from the uh, University of Minnesota study there. Um, locally, in Northern Virginia, we looked at a, a handful of sites. Um, that we had actually done delineations on and, and surveys on, so we had, we had good information for them. Uh, we had three sites that had a less than 5% reduction, and this is looking at um, the way the rule was, was currently published, so with, with intermittent streams still being uh, a part of uh, WOTUS. We had one site in Loudoun County where we had a 50% reduction, so really, really significant there. Um, a lot of it just kind of varied depending on where you were, which, which physiographic province you were in. Um, that site in Loudoun County was in the, the Triassic Basin, so there were a lot of a lot of big flat isolated wetlands that were that were out there. Um, and also kind of just looking at the the underlying rock and what you have. So really, it, it depends on where you are in terms of the, the local effect. Um, potential headwinds to the rule, uh, they have received almost 700,000 comments. So it's going to take them a little while to sort through all that and put a response together. Um, the latest I heard is that um, they would be publishing response to the comments and potentially a final rule uh, at the end of this year, maybe. Um, so we'll see what happens. Uh, I will guarantee that if the final rule is adopted, it's going to get caught up in litigation immediately, just like the 2015 rule was. Um, there are already um, groups out there, you know, Sierra Club, that kind of those kinds of folks that are have their their filings ready to go. As soon as, as soon as this gets published, they will be at the courthouse uh, submitting their their lawsuits. Um, so, but that's the that's the world we're living in. Um, it's, it's interesting, uh, it's, it's ever changing. Uh, and, and I think hopefully what I've done here is really just highlight the need for, for y'all. If, if you don't, if wetlands aren't your thing is bringing in the right folks that, that have the, the knowledge to, to help you through the, the situations and understanding, uh, what's regulated, what's not, what are the next steps? What do I need to do in terms of a, a permit and that sort of thing? Because this is a, um, uh, it's a big issue and it's not simple. So, any questions? Yes, sir. Um, so, for the folks in the web, the, uh, the question is: are there, are there any certifications that would be recommended to, to pursue as a, as a contractor to better understand wetlands? Um, certifications, probably not. Um, we've got folks that are. 
uh, professional wetland delineators certified by the state and also professional wetland scientists. And that's um, you know, a larger national body that does that certification. Um, but those are folks that are out on the ground doing, doing the delineations, have that uh, uh, biology or ecology background. There are, however, some really good classes um, that I would recommend. Um, Wetland Training Institute has some really good classes on the regulations. Um, uh, there's a, a place that, that we use to, for our intern classes sometimes um, to, get to, talk, to do instruction on wetland donation. Uh, the Swamp School, uh, Mark Sealinger down there, he's, he's been doing this for, for a long time and training is, is his thing. So those would be some options. Um, and certainly, you know, call your, call your favorite consultant. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's definitely not a simple thing. So there, there's no like direct certification for, you know, the, the wetland regulations and that, and that sort of thing, but certainly having, having folks that are in the know, having folks that, that have some of those, those national or, or state certifications will, will help. Um, and then, uh, on top of that, some of those classes and things like that. So absolutely. Anything else? All righty. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate your time.